Hey guys, welcome to this video, which is going to be an intro to the idea of limits and how to calculate basic limits. If you've never watched my videos before, I highly recommend you pause and try the examples when prompted. Also highly recommend you try to take notes. There are free guided notes available at dividingconquermath.com if you're interested in that. Okay, so let's get into this. So the thing that I want to start with is I want to graph this function here, x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. Now, just at looking at this function, you might have the sense of, oh, hey, the top of this, I could totally factor like this, right? And if I were to factor this like this, then you might say to yourself, oh, and look, the x minus 2's drop out. And all of this is true. So the graph of f of x here, at first maybe it looks like it's a lot, but actually it kind of just simplifies to x plus 2. So on the whole, I could actually just plot this x plus 2. However, there is one problem spot, right? And we get that from the factorization. So where is the one place where this function will not exist? It won't exist at x equals 2. So let me write that down. OK, so at x equals 2, we have f of 2 is going to be 0 over 0. So I just need to note that. But on the whole, actually, the way that this function is going to behave, it's going to mostly act like x plus 2. So that's just kind of a, a way to help us graph this. So notice this is really a line. So I can go ahead and just graph the line. So I've got my y-intercept at x equals 2, so right here. And then for my slope, my slope is 1. So I go up 1 over 1. And when I get to x equals 2, I can actually continue this pattern. However, at x equals 2, it doesn't exist, right? So I need to put a little bit of a hole here. And then I can continue on my way. So. I'm actually able to basically use the equation of a line to help me draw this with the exception of I understand that there has to be a hole just to make sense of, of what we found in the factorization. And now we can actually get to the meat of what is a limit. OK, so using this graph, from what you can see, if x equaled 2, what would be the value of this function? Let me write that down. OK, so I've asked this in kind of a weird way. But at x equals 2, just what does it look like the function would be if it existed? Well, just by kind of following along where this is going, so this is all just a line, and it looks like this hole, this hole kind of sees, seems to occur at the point, we'll, we'll call this 2 comma 4, right? It kind of looks like this, this is where the hole is. And the fact that I can predict kind of what the, the y value of this should be this is actually the idea of a limit. So here we would say that the, the value would be, so we'll say this would be 4. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to translate this whole discussion now into math speak. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. So instead of saying now this, this really imprecise language of things like, what would it be? Where does it look like it's going? In the language of mathematics, we say the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is 4. So this is now a more precise way of, staying, of saying this. Now I also want to show you some shorthand. So this idea of x approaches 2, well we actually use an arrow to kind of indicate that. So it looks like this, x approaches 2. Now to state the whole phrase here, this whole limit as x approaches 2 is 4. This is actually how we would write that mathematically. We have the limit as x approaches 2. So the limit x approaches 2 of f of x, this would equal 4. So I'll write that out. So here's the way that you would actually say this. So now, kind of Working off of this graph, I would say, okay, so the limit as x approaches 2, that means I really want to get close to x and say, where does it look like this graph would go? Now, here's the thing. I know that there's a hole here, and that's okay. So it means that the function value does not exist, but the limit is this idea that if it did, we can kind of see where it's going. This is a very informal way to think about limits, but conceptually, we can kind of understand this idea. And in this video, it's just an intro, so we just want to kind of get the conceptual idea behind this. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to pause the video, and I want you to try drawing out this piecewise function. 
and then evaluate this limit. Now what I would highly recommend is that you first draw the piecewise function before you try to evaluate the limit, and then it should all kind of make sense. So give it a go, try drawing it out, and then hit play when you're ready to see the solution. Okay, so if I'm drawing this graph, so I can see here that when x equals one, I'm supposed to have a hole, but otherwise, let's see. If I draw the rest of this out, here's kind of what this would look like. So I'm gonna have this parabola for the most part with this hole here and then it says at x equals 1, the value of this function needs to be negative 2. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to figure out what is the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x. So once again, what you're going to do is you're actually going to look at the graph here. So you're not being asked what is the functional value, you're being asked what is the limit. So if I were just following along on this curve and I knew and I didn't know any better, just from the behavior of this curve, it kind of looks like this is actually the y value. This is what it should be. And so once again, that's this idea of the limit then. So my limit as x approaches 1 of f of x, this would actually equal 2. That's what it looks like it's doing. But if I now asked you an extra question, if I said, what is the value of f of 1? That's totally different, right? So the limit is where does it look like it's doing? And then the functional value, well, if I actually plug in one, so on the graph, I can see that this should actually equal negative two, right? And so this is a really important distinction to make now. The limit is kind of what does the behavior of this function seem like it should be doing? And the functional value is what it's actually doing. All right. So this is kind of the idea behind limits. It's this idea that we kind of have this understanding of patterns of behavior, but limits are not just subject to graphs with holes in them. That is not what limits are about. These examples are really good ways to kind of get you to understand this idea of what something should be, but many limits are actually pretty simple. So I wanna now focus on those. So here's the next kind of graphical situation I want to look at. I want to find the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x when f of x just equals plain old x. So what I want to do first is I want to just graph this. So notice that this is just x, right? There's nothing funky about this. There's no point that does not exist. So this is just going to be this line. Okay, and now using the graph, so I can see here that at x equals 2, so that there's kind of, it's kind of like a twofold thing happening in this case. So as my limit is approaching 2, it looks like the limit of this will also be 2. So first, let's write that down. And you'll also notice in this case that that is actually the functional value, too, right? So if I plug 2 into this function, it's almost silly, right, to, to plug it into this but this would be the functional value. And a lot of times limits are actually just going to equal the functional value. So they don't have to be this crazy thing where you know, you, you, like you're gonna have a hole in it. It can be much, much simpler. And in fact, so this type of function when it comes to limits, this is actually kind of a special one because it is so simple. This particular function is what we call the identity function. And from this, we can actually just generalize the limits. So if you have a limit of this form where it's just x, that's your limit, then the limit as x approaches c of x is just c itself. So you can just plug in c. And that's really what we did in the last example, right? We basically just plugged in 2 and said that's what it is. And so that's fine. You can totally have limits that are just that simple. All right, so now let's do another one. So now I want to find the limit as x approaches negative 3 when f, when f of x equals 4. I can't speak. Okay, so once again, I want to just graph this function. And so this would be my function, right? There's f of x equals 4. Okay, so now as I look at the graph, so let's find where x is approaching 3 or where x is 3 in this case. So if I follow along here, here's where negative 3 is. And well, it looks like my y value in this case will be 4. So 
In this case, I would say that the limit as x approaches negative 3 of f of x, it just equals 4. And you'll also notice once again, so constant functions are kind of these weird things, right? They mean that no matter what, the value, it doesn't matter what you plug in, the value is just going to be 4. It's just like that. So this behavior here is also something we can categorize and, and just generalize for all limits. So a function that looks like this, where it's f of x equals k, so it's just it equals some number. This is what's called a constant function. And we can generalize this by saying that the limit of any constant function is just that constant in itself. So now we've seen two limits that actually are very simple to figure out. And from using these two limits, actually, we can evaluate a ton of limits. So now what I want to show you are a few limit laws. So highly recommend you write these down. These are kind of just some basic rules of things you're allowed to do with limits. And they make evaluating limits very simple. So here's the first part of this. So I'm going to have, I'm going to assume that I have um, these numbers L, H, C, and K. So I have the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals L and the limit as X approaches C of G of X equals H. Okay, so these are kind of like the, the first things that you just want to make sure you know and, and have written down. And from here, we get a whole bunch of limit laws. So I'm just going to show them to you. Pause the video if you need to write them down. So the first two limit laws are the sum rule and the difference rule. So these are actually nice and straightforward. So if you're adding two different um, functions, basically then you can just, and you know their limits, then you can basically just add the limits together. Or if you're subtracting those two functions, then you can basically just subtract the two limits away from one another. So makes just evaluating limits a little bit more straightforward. Okay, moving on to the next one. We have the constant multiple rule. So if I have some constant k that's being multiplied um, by my function, well, like I said, I already knew the limit of this function f of x. So now if I'm just multiplying that function by this, this other number k, I can really just multiply k times that limit. So I can almost like factor it out in some ways. So I'll show you how to use that in a few minutes. Then we have the product rule. So if I'm multiplying two functions together and I already know their limits, the limit of this is l, the limit of this is h, then the limit of the entire thing will just be the same thing as multiplying those two limits together. Then we have the quotient rule, which says if you are dividing the two limits, you can effectively just divide their two actual limits. As you see here, of course, h can't be zero in this case. And then we have the power rule and the root rule. So these might be a little difficult to understand. I'm going to show you an example of these in a second. But basically, if you know the limit of, say, the inside function here, so f of x, so we know that that limit is l, then basically if you're trying to just take a power of that, then you just take a power of that limit. So these are ways of kind of simplifying certain limits. Now, there are two other handy theorems for evaluating limits. So I just want to show you those real quick. So one has to do with the limits of polynomials. So this is technically a theorem. So this is allowing you to then go ahead and just evaluate anything that, that works like this. So if you have a polynomial, then to find the limit of that polynomial means you can just plug in whatever your C is. So it makes it super, super simple. And just in case you forgot what a polynomial looks like. So here's the mathematical definition. So the whole idea behind this is that you have to have basically um, positive integer exponents. So in case that example didn't um, jive your memory, here are just a couple of examples. So you're looking for things that have just positive integer exponents and whatever constant that you want. So notice in this last one, so I put pi here as one of my constants. So you can have whatever crazy numbers you want in front. It's just all about the exponents. They have to be positive integers. So just a quick reminder on that. The other theorem that we have is the limits of rational functions, so which says if you've got two polynomials on top of one another, then to find the limit of that, you just go ahead and you, you plug in whatever your C is once again to the top and to the bottom. Of course, this is provided that that does not make the bottom equal zero, which is something that we'll talk about later on as to what happens when the bottom equals zero, but that's for another video. Okay, so I've just thrown a ton at you, of course, but um, like this actually works out a lot nicer than it might seem. So all of those things basically open up the doors for you to evaluate tons and tons of limits. So for instance, starting with this first one here, so notice this is a polynomial. So basically what that last, one of those last theorems did was basically say, I am allowed to just plug in my number to evaluate this limit. 
So this is even simpler than having to graph it and figure it out and everything, right? So it's, it's a very straightforward way of actually doing this. So those theorems and laws that we have are super, super handy. So now looking at B and thinking about the limit laws that we have, the thing that you'll notice with this is that this is actually a rational function. So we have a limit law that tells us exactly how we want to um, evaluate this. We really can just plug the one in. So because we have a law that gives us permission to do that, it makes our lives a lot easier. So let's see, try to plug everything in correctly like this. So then I just sort this out. So I get five plus two over negative three. And so this is seven over negative three. So what I want you to do here is I actually want you to pause the video and give these two limits a try. Again, they're pretty straightforward, but just to give you a moment to think about everything and then hit play when you're ready to see the solution. Okay, so starting with this first one. So notice that this is a square root of this limit. So what our limit laws were trying to tell us actually is how to kind of break this up. So if I'm kind of getting thrown off by that, I could alternatively think about this problem like this. So I could really evaluate this type of problem here and then I just take the square root of whatever the answer to this is. So that's the point of those limit laws. They help you figure out what is the best way to break down certain problems if you're unsure. And this here is just another polynomial, right? So I can just plug in two. So if I do that, I get, um, so I'll just plug it in five times two plus four. And so then this just becomes the square root of 14. And that would actually be it. That's my entire limit. So the limit laws told me I can actually evaluate just the part underneath and then I'm good to go. Okay. So starting here, or so now moving on to D. So once again, this kind of, um, you can break this down using the limit laws, I guess. So if you wanted to, you could say, well, that five isn't gonna change anything really, and the square root's not really changing anything. If I wanna figure out what the value of this limit is, I really need to figure out what is the value of this part underneath the square root. So again, this is kind of what the limit laws are informing us to do. We're empowered to kind of make these decisions. And so now if I actually plug this in, I get two plus nine, right? So then I get five times the square root of 11. And so then that would be it in this case. We'd, we'd be good to go and we've, we've evaluated the limit. So that's kind of the whole point of these. So they just kind of makes it a little bit easier to evaluate. Now, if you're looking for more examples on this, I do have a lot more examples of just calculating some basic limits. Um, so feel free to check those out if you're looking for even more examples, but hopefully this was a pretty good overview of what a limit is and just some of the basic limit laws. I have lots of other videos, so hopefully I'll see you in another one. Thanks for watching.